I'm shocked at the levels of contempt, the dripping contempt there is for millions of people. So it's very hard to put that genie back in the bottle, just like the positive side of Brexit is that the democratic genie is yeah. out. Yeah. Also, some of these disdainful, vile views are out, and we now realise that a substantial minority of people in this country see their fellow citizens as lesser human beings than animals and would happily disregard them in a democratic way, but sometimes in a more punitive way, which deprives them of their liberty almost. So, how do we get over that? Hello and welcome to The Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill. This is a podcast in which an esteemed guest joins me to talk about the big ideas, the bad ideas, the problems and the controversies of life in the early 21st century. In this episode, I am delighted to be joined by Claire Fox. Claire is Director of the Academy of Ideas and organiser of the brilliant annual intellectual festival, The Battle of Ideas. She comes from a far left background. Like me, she was a member of the Revolutionary Communist Party and she was publisher of its monthly journal, Living Marxism, where I got my first break in journalism. Claire is a regular commentator in the British media. She is the longest standing panellist on the Moral Maze on Radio 4 and she has also appeared on Question Time on BBC One and Newsnight numerous times on BBC Two. She is author of I Find That Offensive, a book about freedom of speech and the corrosive culture of offence taking. Claire may have been involved in politics and political campaigning for her entire adult life, but last year she got involved in electoral politics. In the European elections, she was elected as the Brexit Party MEP for the northwest of England, a position she held until our exit from the EU at last at the end of January. As a Brexit Party MEP, Claire was one of the key figures holding the government's feet to the fire and helping to ensure that the largest democratic vote in the history of this country, the vote to leave the European Union, was finally enacted. Claire, welcome to the show. Good to be here. I want to start by asking you about the European Union itself, because unlike most people, including most people who oppose it and voted against it, you've been in it for the past few months in the belly of the beast as a member of the European Parliament. I'm sure many people listening to this podcast will have seen clips of you doing your speeches and having your standoffs with the European Union officials in the Parliament. Uh, Can you give us a sense of what it was like? Uh, Is it as feudalistic as European Union sceptics think it is? Is it as undemocratic as we think it is? What is the vibe like? What is the atmosphere like? And what what was your impression in the period of time that you spent there? It is undoubtedly an impressive setup. You know, you go to the European Parliament, you are treated very seriously and as though you are a very important elected representative. And you're there with hundreds, you know, 700 plus people who've been elected from all around Europe, it could go to your head. You could (laughs) think, you know, I must be important because I get my um, chauffeur driven cars Mm -hmm. and and I'm kind of treated with real respect. And we all were. And there is a parliamentary procedure that you go through and you sit in a parliament in the round and you get to speak and so on and so forth. So far, so good. You think, well, you know, what is, what, what could you possibly complain about? But one of the things that really struck me straight away was whereas I was really looking forward to having the opportunity to interact with other Europeans and to, you know, to to be open-minded enough to meet other MEPs, there just is very little interaction between MEPs from different countries or different political backgrounds because the whole place feels so stage managed. I mean, everything is carved up behind the scenes in terms of how much time you get to speak, what groupings you're in, who gets what positions. So it's it's very busy. You could spend your whole life in committees. And in fact, I tried to, in my time there, you know, do as it were what one ought to do as mm. an MEP. I mean, I kind of, despite a kind of caricatured version of what Brexit Party MEPs were doing, we all were involved in all of the different formal committees that we could be in going to parliaments and so on. But, you know, they were lifeless. You know, there there was a deadness behind the eyes, as it were. But you could be busy, 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 because 
there's lots of meetings and lots of business to attend to. But when you actually looked at it, it's of absolutely no avail. Yeah. I would get hundreds of emails from people from the Northwest. Largely, they were set up by Remainers who would be saying, you know, as a constituency in the Northwest, and it was all kind of, you know, cut and paste and every MEP would get the same one. I am outraged about what you're doing there. But sometimes you'd get constituents actually saying, can you help? And then, you, you know, you stop and you think, what power have I got? Oh, none. Mm-hmm. What I could do is maybe write to your MP on your behalf. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? I mean, there was nowhere to run. So what it did was it confirmed what I'd thought, which is, is that the parliament itself has got no power because it's got no legislative initiation as part of its brief. There are massive, huge you know, rows that are almost like World War Three over whether we should adopt Amendment B, C or D, which would tweak an original <laughs> piece of legislation from five weeks to four weeks to three weeks, depending on what it was. You know, that was the, mm. you know, the way when there's nothing to discuss, everything becomes more important. Yeah. The final thing to just say is the, the sectarian nature of the rows between different groupings, how much time they would get to speak on debates, who was allowed to speak. Those kind of things took on an incredible sense of importance. And when you actually looked at it, that's why it felt something like a feudal court. You know, you, 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 there was no democratic heart to it at all. You're not accountable to anyone back home. So everything is between the MEPs mm-hmm. and it's roused between the MEPs and getting in favour with people at the commission so you might get more time and getting to a key position on the committees. All of that, it was soul-destroying. <laughs> so you talk about how it would be easy to get carried away because it is a very grand institution and people no doubt will be injected with a sense of self-importance once they get there. Of course, the difference between a lot of MEPs and the Brexit party MEPs is that you guys actually wanted to be sacked. You wanted your jobs to come to an end. You wanted this to be a very uh, brief period in your lives. But I think what's what's interesting and worth dwelling on for a moment is, as you've just touched upon there, is what the European Parliament actually does. Because to most people, a parliament means a representative body. So it's the body that the people have some control over. We decide who goes in it and we have some capacity to decide what those people ought to pursue politically in terms of policy and so on. But the European Parliament is different, right? Because the initiative actually comes from the European Council over which we don't have direct democratic control. And so did you feel, did, did you get a very clear sense that the European Parliament is a is a quite denuded body whose role is effectively one of rubber stamping or not rubber stamping, but but little more beyond that. Yeah, I mean, exactly the rubber stamping point. That's why I was emphasising that there are rows over where you should vote, but it's on it, policies which have come from somewhere else and they're over the minor and minutiae of those policies, but already determined. So that's the difficulty. I mean, I, I think that I may have even said on a spiked podcast interview with Fraser Myers early on, but you know, when I went the first day that we walked in, there was a lot of press coverage about how the Brexit party MEPs turned their back to classical musicians playing Beethoven's Ode to Joy. And maybe we could talk about that, how these things became so significant when they were nothing. But the biggest shock for me was arriving in a parliament, you know, in a way we kind of, I was, we were there for the day. You know, you arrive at 9.30, you think you're going to be there till 7.30. That parliamentary session ended after 45 minutes because the commission and the council had not decided who we would get to vote for, who was going to run the commission, that then we would decide how the parliament was going to be organised. And because they were having rows in Brussels, we're all sitting in Strasbourg Mm -hmm. and we can't vote on anything because we're waiting for them to tell us. Now, what was shocking to me was that that was not the media story. The media story was that we turned our back on this anthem, which, by the way, is a fantastic and important piece of classical music, a great part of European culture, which I love, a, a piece of music that represents freedom. And how dare the European Union try and claim it as an anthem. And they actually said, stand for the national anthem. That was what they said. (laughs) And we were all like, no. 
And so we didn't boo or hiss, but we just turned our backs. Anyway, uh, uh, that caused some controversy. But why did the media go for that instead of the much more shocking story, which is a parliament that was dismissed for the day? I mean, apart from the utter cost nonsense of dragging everyone across France to go to that and then kind of sending us all home like children. Um, so I was actually, that was my first taste of realising that the power wasn't there. Yeah. You know, we were waiting on someone else. And then eventually, as um, history now records, a name which nobody at that point was discussing as the possible person who would head up the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, her name had never right. been mentioned in any dispatches by anyone. Suddenly this name of this failed German politician who was uh, <laughs> somebody called her the Chris Grayling of German politics <laughs> um, because she was kind of like considered to be everything she touched was a disaster. Suddenly emerged as the front runner, the person who the main political groupings in the parliament were basically told would be the person who would get the job. Suddenly her name emerged and we then have this mockery of an election, which she just about scraped through. But even then it was you know, she was standing against herself almost. I mean, she was the one who was going to get it and she could only just scrape through on that. So everything from then on in revealed to me just exactly as you say, that this isn't a parliament like as any other. Yeah. So it's also, it operates like the House of Lords. Yeah. The House of Lords is a scrutinising body, but it doesn't pretend to be democratic, if you know what I mean. And the mm. democratic legislation, you know, is parliament and then the House of Lords acts as a, as a second chamber. The elected part of the European Union is actually the scrutinising body yeah. of the unelected yeah. power elsewhere. So if you can think of it that way. But the only other thing is, is that we also know that being elected as an MEP in the different member states isn't a major political significant role for anyone. You know, when has ever anyone said that they know their MEP mm. and they go and lobby them and they go and have surgeries. I mean, myself and my fellow MEP, Henrik Ogard Nielsen, opened an office in the Northwest in Stockport and we've used that office and we've had people in and so on. But, you know, the idea that you'd have surgeries, there's no point anyone coming no. to tell you anything because there's nothing to tell them back. It's a complete farce in, when it comes to democracy. So one thing we decided to do, by the way, which I think we did rather effectively as MEPs, for the Brexit party was that we thought, well, the very least we can do to be accountable to the people who voted for us at home is to pull the curtain back. So what we tried to do was to do regular, you know, films and podcasts and all sorts of things saying, this is what happened here so that you know more about how the inner workings of this place happen. And we spoke as much as we could, even when it was an empty chamber, so that people could hear that we were at least trying to formally hold somebody to account there. And actually, it, it shows you the kind of appetite for what's happened with Brexit about people being politicised. People started to watch the European Parliament mm. live, <laughs> but in a way because they could, they were hearing stories from us and they kind of wanted to see it operating. And uh in one of my, it was a very funny thing happened in the last week where, you know, the chair had, as usual, cut me off. Mind you, I do go on. So <laughs> she, I had overrun. Um, but I'd overrun in my 60 second speech by 20 second. And whereas leeway is often given never to Brexit party people. So she'd mm. cut me off. And on social media, there was about four or five people who said that was so disgusting that you were cut off. And I thought, how do you know I was caught? They were watching live, you do think. Um, but I think that leavers, and many leave, people who voted leave have become much more savvy now at, at following politics directly. And I think this is something Spikes have written about, isn't it? Which is you kind of no longer trust secondhand, thirdhand recount. You actually want to see it for yourself. And so yeah. if you can watch it live on this brilliant TV, there's lots of technology in Brussels and Strasbourg, then you can actually see it for yourself. And people start saying, wow, that's much worse than I thought. I think the thing that's very useful about that summary and about your experience and and, and the way you've written about it as well is to, to many Eurosceptics, which, which is not just people like us, but millions upon millions of people in this country and across Europe, in fact, 
we've always had an instinctive sense that the European Union is an undemocratic body. And, and there's plenty of evidence to demonstrate that, you know, the, the way in which the Irish were forced to vote again twice, first in, resp- in response to the Nice Treaty, which they rejected, and then the Lisbon Treaty, which they also rejected. The way in which French and Dutch voters were just overridden when they rejected the European Constitution in 2005, the way in which the Greeks were treated like in the most awful way and whose democratic wishes were utterly ignored and and played second fiddle towards the needs of the European Central Bank. So all of these things have been happening for a very long time. And I wonder if, would you go so far as to say that the European Parliament is a very expensive attempt to add a gloss of democracy to what is very clearly a, a an almost imperious institution. Because I think what what was quite striking to me, watching some of the developments in the European Parliament, watching speeches by you and other members of of the Brexit Party, is that it was an incredibly grand institution, but also one that was just extraordinarily hollow and didn't have any real power. And the Ursula von der Leyen appointment, essentially, which was then uh, rubber stamped, is a very good example of that. So do you think that the European Parliament, which you have direct experience of, is almost like a gloss upon what is an incredibly undemocratic Europe-wide institution, which is hostile towards the interests and desires of, of national electorates? So one of the things that's fascinating, actually, in Brussels itself is when you're in this place, which is a huge, almost like a campus, you know, it's got hairdressers and shops and, you know, it's a kind of <laughs> smoking rooms internally on every floor, by the way, which I found very civilised, <laughs> but nonetheless great hypocrisy at the very nature of that compromise. But anyway, all of these things going on, huge numbers of offices. When you were in Brussels itself, you realised that actually this was the least important institution in Brussels. I mean, like in every echo chamber, you know, you could think that you were very important, but you actually only had to walk outside or, you know, you might think, well, where are the media? And you think, oh, they're up the road, you know, they're at the commission, they're at the castle, they're not here, right? This is like toy town. And and in that sense, you really realised that this was, yes, very much a democratic winner. And also in the committee meetings you would have, and especially at the start of a new mandate, which we were involved in, obviously, the commissioners would kind of line up. They were like the people that you had to uh, beg or kind of lobby. So they'd come to say I was in CULT, which was the Culture and Education Committee, and there'd be a, a line of invited commissioners. And effectively the chairs of the committee and all the important people in the committee and then everyone in the committee would be addressing their remarks to the commissioners who were there saying, and effectively it was, can we have more money? It's always about more money. I mean, you know, we think it's really important you give Erasmus plus more money, or we think our cultural citizens of Europe awards should, you know, can you, can you take this message back? So you were supplicants all the time to Mm. these more important people they would come in and then they would kind of leave, you know, they would, they were like, (laughs) that you kind of knew who the important people were in any of these committee meetings. And that was also true, even in the parliamentary chamber that, you know, the, the, there would be more people in attendance if there was commissioners there doing talks and then they'd speak, then they'd leave, then everyone else would leave the parliament, be more or less, the chamber be more or less open. So you always knew that. Yeah. But one thing that I think that, is misunderstood, and by the way, I think misunderstood by many Eurosceptics as well, is it isn't that this kind of bureaucratic, you know, this anti-democratic institution, the EU, imposes things on the UK. I mean, this is something which I had arguments with my own colleagues in the Brexit party and other Eurosceptics from around Europe, because I think that it became very clear to me that I kind of felt like I recognised a lot of the legislation that was coming down from either the Council or the Commission, because guess what? It was designed in Britain, you know? I mean, often it was uh, British politicians or German politicians or French politicians who found it easier to go and uh, convince their peers in Brussels of the need to highly regulate the internet to ban hate speech, say, than it was they could convince them far easier than they could convince their own electorates at home. Mm. So one of the things that was also clear to me was that this idea that this kind of bureaucracy forces the UK government into a situation, I mean, in that sense, some of the people who were 
most ardent Remainers are right on this because they've kind of sometimes said, well, I don't know what you're talking about. The council is made up of, you know, the prime ministers and the commissioners are appointed by prime ministers from different member states. And they're right, right? They, they're they right about that. But what they what they misunderstand is, is that the whole setup is a voluntary agreement amongst those people who run all of the different countries to ring fence off decision making from the electorates in each and every member state. So I found it useful to remember that and to remind myself of that rather than constantly seeing them as a foreign imposition. Yeah. It also meant that you could appeal more directly to MEPs there and also staff and lobbyists and all the rest of it who were Democrats. You know, you could remind them that we weren't trying to just get out of the European Union because we'd voted that way. I mean, that was why we were specifically there because of the referendum. But to also point out, look, this is anti-democratic. It's not just, it's not just a democratic veneer, this parliament. The place is set up as a break on popular democratic accountability in each and every member state represented in this parliament. Yeah. You know, it's not just the flaws in the way you point Ursula von der Leyen. It's the fact that the prime ministers of all these places agree with that system. Yeah. So that's, that was a sort of, that was brought home to me. And, and I think is an important thing that still hasn't been fully assimilated, I think. Um, so I hope it will be because now, of course, you know, when they bring in legislation that says we're going to bring in uh, online harms legislation mm. or we're going to ban mental cigarettes or any of these nonsense things, they can no longer sort of cite the European Union as the kind of home from which these ideas came. I think that's a really important point. And in fact, uh, it's probably the most important thing that's been revealed to many, many British people over the past three and a half years, which was the keenness and almost the desperation with which Britain's own political class wanted to keep hold of the European Union arrangements. And I think what a lot of people realised over this period of time is even if they had previously seen the European Union as this kind of foreign oligarchy and is stamping its boot on Britain's neck, uh, I think a, a lot of people will have realised that it's more complicated than that. And and yeah. what you have is in the UK is a political establishment that is that was, uh, I think they may well now have learned their lesson, but which was absolutely desperate to maintain the European Union structures because it allowed them to offset responsibility for their own political decision making yeah. and to outsource democratic authority to an institution which was beyond the people. I think that's actually... W- you know, you say that the European Union is is kind of toy town, unimportant institution. But I think one of the very important things that the Brexit Party did was to uh, pull back the veil on this institution and bring attention to the fact that it is something that the uh, British establishment itself was absolutely given the green light to and doing so for reasons which were about avoiding democratic accountability and avoiding engagement with their own people. And so I I think that in many ways is the key point to learn from the European Union experience. You know, it's, it's I, I don't know about you, but I've been a Eurosceptic for a long time. I mean, not that, <laughs> but I wasn't, you know, I wasn't agitating for a referendum. I thought there probably should be yeah. one, but if you'd have asked people in 2015 or even the start of 2016, you know, what my views on the EU, a lot of people wouldn't even have known. And obviously I sort of had a public role in the media. So I, I, I was commenting on, on, on Brexit in the build up to the referendum, but it wasn't something that you could say that I was totally associated with. In the final months, of course, when they started to turn on voters already before the vote, when they started to that whole slander of racism and so on. I, yeah. I kind of spoke more. But anyway, one of the things that I would say was I was genuinely shocked by the fact that what I could not get over was that I always thought that the Tory party were Eurosceptic. There was loads of people. So I would meet Eurosceptic Tory MPs in the build up to the referendum who were ardently arguing to remain in the EU. Mm. And I couldn't understand it. And I, I mean, I was like genuinely like, you're what? You're, you know, <laughs> because I had sort of thought it was a slightly quirky but dominant wing in the Conservative Party. And what I realised was that most of the Eurosceptic MPs in the Tory party, in the Conservative party, were Remainers. Because Euroscepticism was a way that you could deflect blame. You know, you, you could blame the EU 
it, it, it sort of was a bit of the Boris Bendy banana question. It was a kind of glib thing. Oh, it's the EU. What did it? And they did that, but they'd all the time. No, it wasn't a lie or anything, but actually they were totally on board with the idea that a clique of politicians could act in an unaccountable way and make decisions away from the electorate. That bit they'd bought, then they could kind of ridicule in a caricatured way the EU for imposing and stamping on British sovereignty. But they hadn't they weren't so serious about it that they when they had the opportunity for a referendum, yeah. that's why all of them lined up. I mean it was extraordinary, but you could see therefore that it was an establishment propped up institution by the British ruling class. And they actually, it was very convenient for them. And Euroscepticism was a, a kind of joke for many mm. people. And I think when you look at the Leave campaign, that's why there were very few high profile conservatives involved in the, in the official Leave campaigns or even unofficial. So it was a kind of, it, that was a revelation to me, yeah. actually. I mean, I hadn't sort of thought that. And I think then, as you've said, as time has gone on, you know, we started to see the way the British establishment were desperate to not leave, what lengths they would go against their own electorate. So I did think that you're right, that that short time in the European Parliament was a time when you could just expose that further. And by the way, I have to say, I mean, the conduct of the British MEPs who were Remainers is just hard to describe. <laughs> there was a sort of sycophancy, which I have rarely experienced, because they would always stand up and say, Madam President, we just want to say <laughs> how ashamed we are of the people over there at the back, which is the Brexit Party, and it's their behaviour, but they do not represent the British people. Everyone's changed their minds, or we mm. have the rise of racism and xenophobia and or misinformation, Russian bots. I mean, but they were constantly grovelling and saying, we want you all to know that back home these people do not represent and it was like well actually these people at the back just won the european yeah. parliament elections for a start off but nonetheless they could isolate us so the joy the joy i had of being able to look them in the eye mm. at the end and say we're going mm. but they were utterly uh you know what craven mm. in their uh a real betrayal, it felt to me. The real maligning of ordinary people in this country, the way they talked about them, the, the whole thing, that it was embarrassing. Now, talking to a number of MEPs from other countries, many of whom weren't even Eurosceptic, but some that I got to know, about some of those people, they said they found their fawning embarrassing. So what was really funny was that they were they they will d dispute this, and if they're listening, will no doubt troll me to death. But what I thought was really interesting was their kind of enthusiasm for the European Parliament and the EU project was so over the top that even the most <laughs> ardent Euro Federalist was slightly embarrassed, squee squirmy, <laughs> as they kind of like did these things, and they'd be sort of thinking, "God, have you no shame, no dignity, you know?" And so, I mean, I cannot begin to tell you how embarrassing so there's the story is that the brexit party were a disgrace and we behave badly actually largely uh, misinformation genuinely but actually that kind of craven behavior but it was it, it really was awful and i think that that's important to note because i do think that sections of the british political establishment and parties and so on had really bought into that yeah. idea that they had more in common. They felt more at home, more at ease with their fellow MEPs more around the place. And they loved those committees. They, they loved those wrangles over points of order and all of these kind of issues, these petty minded issues, because that was far preferable to, you know, the Lib Dem MEP for wherever going and facing their own electorate who basically would be going, what are you talking about? Yeah. So in that sense, look, I've, I, you know, I've learned a lot about politics from that experience as well myself. You're listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. If you like this podcast and Spike's other podcasts and also the articles and essays that Spike publishes every day, please think about giving us a donation. Spike's content is free and we want to keep it free and donations really help us to do that. 
head over to Spike's donation page now at www.spiked-online.com. I want to talk about the people or, or ordinary people, as, as I sometimes refer to them, when I, always, I always get told off for doing so, because I think that the way in which they have been spoken about over the past three and a half years is one of the things that has shocked even me. And I'm someone who's been talking about the snobbery of the elites for a very long period of time. On this podcast, we've had numerous levers, mostly left-wing levers. In fact, Kate Hoey, Gisela Stewart, Paul Embry, Morris Glassman, also more right-leaning levers like Matt Ridley and others. And all of them have expressed this horror, in fact, and and none of them had any pretensions, particularly in the political class uh, as this kind of wonderful institution, but all of them have been horrified to varying degrees at what has happened over the past three and a half years. So I do think a reckoning with what has happened is in order. And I think one of the things that I found really despicable since June 2016 was the speed and the intensity with which voters' common sense was called into question, their values were called into question, and then that gave way to this um, demonization of them as racist and xenophobic. And it very quickly snowballed into one of the most anti-democratic drives I can remember in my lifetime. And I think that's one of the things that the Brexit Party experienced in the way you've just described. But one of the things that the Brexit Party experienced was this notion that you guys were almost because you had won the European Parliament elections and almost because you did represent that kind of intensive, uh, largely working class, quite northern desire, particularly you as uh, the MEP for Northwest England, because you represented all of that, that made you instantly suspect. So I wanted to ask you, it, looking back over the past three and a half years, have you been shocked what by what has been said? And also, do you think we can move on from that? Or do you think we need to have a proper discussion, a, a proper analysis of the breakdown in political decorum before we can move on to some uh, more kind of normal form of politics? It's very difficult, isn't it? Because I've, I've just actually had a weekend in which I, you know, typically on social media have had a run in with some of the more extreme elements of the um, Remainer mm. hardcore that are left and their ways of talking about people and the accusations of racism and knuckle dragging and all the rest of it have been so vile. And I really try and resist replying or, or getting wound up by it, but I get wound up by it because yeah. I cannot stand it. I'm so outraged by mm. I can't bear it when they do it. You know, I can't bear that they think that people are stupid and vile and xenophobic and anti, you know, you know, somebody said, you know, Brexit is just anti-foreigners and, you know, and then you go, no, it isn't. And it's like the whole thing. And then it kind of starts and it unravels. And some of these prejudices have really taken me aback. I mean, it has taken me aback. And it's interesting because at the same time that that's been going on, there's been this in the last few days, a bit of a discussion about somebody that it looks like the Tories have taken on who has written mm. some pretty, you know, foul things in terms of a, a eugenicist account of, of people. It's a bit murky as to who said what when, by the way. But but so I'm not particularly entering into that. But what I think is extraordinary is people can well be outraged at something that somebody said about eugenics and people's intelligence and race and and and, and I and I myself am pretty bored. But the people who are condemning them are the very people who at the same time have got no embarrassment whatsoever about talking about stupid, you know, easily duped leave voters who were anti foreign You know, in other words, and also with the knuckle-dragging, some of these more animalistic, anti-humanist, I mean, you know, basically the dehumanising of one's opposition mm. has been, you know, to levels that I never thought feasible, you know, lift up the stone, vermin, mm. all of these things, you know, gammon itself, whilst a kind of slightly semi-jokey thing, you know, in the end, yeah, it's the pretty, yeah, it's pigs, yeah. it's it's also, it's not human, right? it's a lump yeah. of meat, and it, you know, and it also describes people's skin colour, and it's a making a mockery of their looks. All of these things, just in a period when you can be absolutely uh, cast out of polite society for quoting Shakespeare, uh, <laughs> talking about man and apes, as happened recently to a well-known news reader. 
But yet those same people, you know, the sensitivity doesn't exist. I think one of the things, though, that's tricky for me is that I have found that I get more wound up by it than anything else. I mean, I never thought I'd get like this, but I am... I, I, it's not even like a romantic attachment to the working class or anything like, I just, I'm shocked at realizing the levels of contempt, the dripping contempt there is for millions of people. I take, find it very difficult. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that has occurred to me, which if you think about it would be true is, you know, I think we probably all of us who were involved in left wing politics would probably know that most of the people in the establishment probably had a imagined secretly, you know, they're sitting in their clubs. They probably did not seriously think that the cleaner and the dustbin man, woman, or whoever was actually probably their equal, right? Mm. And they probably had a little bit of a condescending attitude to people who'd left school without qualifications and were Northern and spoke in funny accents and all of these things, right? But they confined those thoughts to amongst themselves. You I mean you would never ever say it out loud because you understood that in order for the system to work, you had to at least go along with rhetorically the idea that everyone was equal at the ballot box that we were, we didn't look down on us. What has been remarkable about the leave vote is, and I've often said this is, I've, I've said on things where I've listened to people and I've said, we can hear you, you know, yeah. they discuss people. <laughs> I was like, you know, that we can hear this conversation. I mean, I don't know what's happened to you, you know, a number of these QCs when they have these conversations, mm. you think you're saying, on, we know what you're, mm. you're talking about to us or ordinary people and you're saying it out loud. That might have been a dirty little secret of the British establishment, but that dirty little secret is well and truly out in the open. And that has also let rip or, or allowed, as it were, and, you know, one has to be careful because I have no boundaries on free speech. So I do know that, you know, this is what people say about all sorts of things, you know, but once those things get said, they yeah. can't get unsaid. Yeah. And then it allows people to express in a respectable fashion some pretty vile things out loud and that's why I, that permission has been granted now so it's very hard to put that genie back in the bottle just like i the positive side of brexit is that you know the democratic genie the agency genie is yeah. out yeah. also some of these kind of disdainful these vile views are out and what can you they're there and we now realize that a substantial minority of people in this country see their fellow citizens as lesser human beings than animals and you know, animalistic and would happily kind of disregard them in a democratic way, but sometimes in a more, you know, punitive way, you just kind of deprive them of their liberty almost. So how do we get over that? Because it is tricky because I also firmly believe that most people aren't like that. Mm. The majority of people who voted remain actually accepted the vote. Yeah. First of all, in 2016, a bit like in any kind of relationship breakup. I know these are naff analogies, but, you know, obviously they then were given false hope by the establishment. He said, you know, you're heartbroken that we're leaving the EU. There's a chance we aren't. Don't worry, trust us. So they kind of <laughs> carried on. So they kind of like couldn't get over it because they were suddenly given this possibility that the marriage might work sort of thing. So that goes on. But I still think that over a period of time, I, I met somebody, uh, a great guy last week in Stockport, who came to, to you know, a young guy, um, who voted Remain and he, he is now an ardent Brexiteer because he could not get over the, the anti-democratic attitudes as revealed because some of his family had voted leave. He was shocked and he was kind of very much in the kind of middle class, you know, professional kind of young person who just has now had it all revealed to him. So I, I want to also say that it's not such a large gap to get over because mm. I don't think it includes the majority of people. But because we experience so much of this thing through the extremes, yeah. there is a silent majority of people who might be unhappy that we live in the European Union and think it was the wrong decision, but they're decent people. They don't go around thinking people are ape-like knuckle-draggers who are stupid. They just think we've made a mistake, yeah. which is a perfectly legitimate political yeah. position to hold, in my view. So. I want to get over it. Yeah. And when we say have a reckoning, it's hard to know what you do. Yeah. And I try not to go over it. <laughs> but as I say, once a kind of piling happens on social media, as it has done to me this weekend, 
It's like and like during the um, European elections, people will laugh, but I, I uh, completely plagiarised the slogan, you know, they go low, we go high. Yeah. And to the point where people started telling me that Michelle Obama was copying my slogan, but anyway, it was <laughs> a bit embarrassing. But anyway, but I'd say at every rally and I, you know, as a way of kind of encouraging us to, to people not to get bitter and just name call. But I'd be saying on stalls, you know, on the streets, you know, they go low, we go high. And then somebody come back past us and say, you racist scumbags. And I'd go, you don't get, you get back. <laughs> so all these people I'd just give an election to, because I think it, you want, you know, you want to be calm. You want to say, keep the lid on it. But some of the insults are so outrageous, mm. not at me or you or those of us in the public sphere, who, God, you know, we're tough enough. But just the way that whole sections of people have had their reputations traduced yeah. and destroyed is pretty grim. I mean, I find it harder to get over. And, and that's not because I just found it as shocking as you obviously found it and as you've just described there. But I think for me, the reckoning is not so much about getting back at these people. And I completely agree. It's not Remain voters. It's not the 16.1 million people who voted Remain. It's it's the infinitely smaller number of people who are very influential, very powerful, have a lot of money, who who devoted, you know, most of their moral energy over the past three and a half years to preventing Brexit from happening. It's it's the elite, basically. Yeah. It, and they, you're not supposed to say the elite these days, but it is the elite, the elitists. And the reason I think it's important in my view, the reason it's important not to get over it is because it's basically for one very straightforward reason, which is that I think the explosion of hatred over the past three and a half years points to the possibility that democracy as an ideal wasn't taken very seriously. So, you know, I can handle being insulted and I can even handle, you know, working class communities being insulted because they've got tough hides and they've probably face worse than this, historically speaking. But I think what it points to is the possibility that the battles we thought we had won, courtesy of the St. Peter's Square March in 1819, and then the Chartists in the 1840s, and then the Suffragettes in the 1910s, all those battles we thought we had won, and we thought it had been established that we were equal, and that the woman who cleaned the mansion in which the Lord lived had the same democratic power as the man himself. We thought that had been established. And then, so over the past three and a half years, I found myself thinking, maybe that's not true. So I, I, I think one of the reasons it's important to to have the discussion is because, is, is just to establish that democracy is actually a real thing in this country. And not simply, as you have just described it, a, a lip service that people pay, but is actually a real lived experience, a dynamic experience, an experience of power on the part of ordinary people. So I think that's actually something that's just kind of worth drawing out. You know, the hatred and the contempt and the bile and the snobbery, you can almost live with it to a certain extent, although it's really horrendous. But it's the question of the fact that this stuff was bubbling under the surface suggests that maybe democracy as an idea wasn't as broadly accepted as we had hoped. Yeah, I think that's right. So I think my way of tackling this is to see it now as, based on what we were talking about earlier, a recognition of the fact that the EU was not so much a, a foreign imposition, but something that was brought into yeah. in an anti-democratic way by, you know, uh, UK politicians and elites and establishments and multinationals based here and all the rest of it. But now that you could say that democracies come home and politicians have to look us directly in the eye and you know, say, oh, I made this decision and I'm now accountable to you. It's finding ways of making that case with democracy constantly and continually and not squandering the opportunities of bringing democracy home. And I don't think it's that straightforward because I absolutely agree with you, of course, that the revelation has been how thin the democratic roots, you know, what those things we took for granted, as you explained very well, um, actually, they they aren't to be taken for granted. I mean, they have to be fought for in every generation. I mean, I I think Tony Benn has made that made that point very well, actually, which is time and again, each time you have to make the case of democracies, you can't think democracy is a done deal. Now, the danger that we face at the moment is that we have this opportunity. People have had their voices heard that now, thankfully, mm. after the general election, I think the electorate were very savvy in their decision to uh, use the Conservative Party as a vehicle for their own ends and not because it all become Tories. And also they made a decision that 
you know, didn't do the Brexit party any favours. They said, no, we're not going to use you, <laughs> right? Because we actually want to ensure this happens. And they, yeah. in a way, that's the great thing about democracy is the election won't do what you tell them and <laughs> won't behave. And that's good, in my opinion. Agencies back on the table, you know, suddenly people realise, well, actually, we can change things, you know. And what was at risk when Brexit was nearly defeated by the Remain Alliance was that people would draw the conclusion that you couldn't change things. So, you know, that, that, that it was no, there was no point even trying because you, they, there'd been this big revolt and then you just got stamped on. So great, a great sort of psychological win. But then how do you make that come alive? Because now we've got a huge Tory majority. Doesn't matter what way you look at it, it's a Tory majority. And even though I go along with the idea that the Conservative Party is no longer the Conservative Party because of the people who voted for it. And in some ways it's been torn apart. It doesn't know whether it's blue collar Conservative. It doesn't know what that means. It's, you know, they've got MPs elected that they don't even know who they are in mm. Story central office. It's like, who is that person that got elected up yeah. in Durham? You know what I mean? <laughs> Do we know them? Has anyone <laughs> been there? You know, because that, that in a way it was a, a, as much a surprise to them. Yeah. But once that happens, how do you now make that democratic promise come alive? And, you know, it's difficult because I, I didn't, you know, the Brexit party isn't the vehicle. Um, you want new movements to emerge, but you can't wish them into existence. I mean, they have to emerge or not. You know, I, I've been at discussions recently in the Northwest where I've been invited to speak or in, and in Yorkshire last week where people are saying, you know, should we join the Conservatives and become like a momentum or entryist group in the cons. You know, people are kind of coming up or should we stand as independents in, in council elections? I mean, how do you kind of make your voice matter now? You know, I'm not, I don't want to wait five years, people will say. And I can sense a frustration that there isn't the democratic mechanisms in the country to quite express that. And I've written, and I know that, Spikes have had articles on this as well. I've just written an article critiquing the citizens' assemblies. I mean, you know, when you think of it, what you're now offered are these completely contrived citizens' assemblies that are the very opposite of an assembly of citizens. You know, they are only if the citizens are under the control of, you know, a, a group of experts who will tell you exactly what to, how to think and all the rest of it. So it isn't, given to me how it's all going to yeah. unravel. And I think therefore your warning about the reckoning is that what I think we need to do is to find ways of encouraging as much experimentation in relation to democratic forms as possible. H having the arguments out about PR, first past the post, House of Lords, all of these different things should be on the table, but not just the traditional constitutional questions like that, but just everything, you know, should be held up to democratic scrutiny. But I just don't think it's given. Yeah. And, I'm, and, and I'm aware of the fact that people are tired. So there's a great enthusiasm on the one hand, but it's also a little bit like for a lot of people, you know, it's like right now I can, I did vote Lee three and a half years ago. I've now been kind of like mobilized to an inch of my life. Of, I've become obsessed with Brexit. I now need to go and make the kids tea or, you know, concentrate mm. on something else or take up a hobby. So you also don't want to force people into a false sense of political engagement. Mm. But I also think people are very on their guard about being sold out. Yeah. So it's a question of making the most of the opportunity without romantically trying to pretend that you've got huge opportunities when in fact you've got real challenges ahead. I want to come back to the question of, of what you aptly describe as, uh, as democratic promise, because I think that's really, really important. But one thing I wanted to touch on there, because you mentioned Tony Benn, who in recent years has become an idol of mine in a way that he might not have been in the past, but in terms of his clarity on the question of democracy and his clarity on the issue of the European Union, I think he's become a kind of guiding light for many Eurosceptics, uh, particularly Labour-leaning Eurosceptics, who I think were working-class Eurosceptics, who I think were probably the determining force in the Brexit vote in terms of pushing it. Morris Glassman on this podcast said that it was, you know, uh, Euroscepticism was pretty much freaks and, and strange and weirdos. And then in came the working classes and turned it into something with absolute democratic clout in the 2016 referendum. But the reason I wanted to just touch on the Tony Benn issue, 
is just to look at the left right thing for a minute because uh, your personal experience when you announced that you were standing for um the Brexit party I'm laughing because I was on Sky News papers that night and there was a a sun article about Nigel Farage's communist <laughs> and there was lots of stuff like that the commies standing for the Brexit party and and why is this radical left winger standing for this kind of people call uh, uh, Nigel Farage far right which is completely and utterly incorrect but uh, you get the gist so one of the things i thought that was quite important about what you did and and this is not just a romantic argument but one of the uh, things i thought was important about the role that you played and and other left leaning or or traditionally leftist euroskeptics i think one of the important roles that they played was just a reminder that this wasn't euroskepticism wasn't necessarily an eccentric right wing phenomenon that was only existent in the 1922 committee and among conservative societies at oxford university but it actually was a mass sentiment and a mass sentiment in particular among former mining communities and in parts of wales and in parts of the north of england and in parts of essex and in you know the more working class suburbs of london so um did you feel a responsibility to make that argument did you f- find yourself feeling that it was important you know not to self consciously distance yourself from right wing brexiteers but to bring in the argument for uh, a more working class mass uh, traditionally leftist view of um anti european union sentiment so before the brexit party i think one of the things that was discussed quite a lot during that three and a half years before the european elections or the brexit party even existed was this attempt at suggesting that the leave vote had been a, you know contrived by some far right cabal um and uh, that it kind of you know whipped up as xenophobia amongst working class people so there was a distancing that went on from of leave from any left wing roots and that was true and that that was well and truly being cemented but the interesting thing about it was was that only just the year before the uh, referendum was called people like Owen Jones who actually was the person who came up with the phrase lexit yeah had actually you know to my surprise i agree with him on this one had said you know after what the eu has done to greece in terms of its imposition of austerity we've got to have a lexit movement and you know people like these left wing commentators i mean it's laughable to say it now you know paul mason what <laughs> um, but anyway these kind of people were sort of, but there was actually quite a lot of them were saying yeah. you know we 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 need to really gather around and so when the referendum was called i think there was an interesting moment there because i thought that the left would be more enthusiastic yeah. in terms of the referendum but as we know they they lost their bottle and yeah. i hardly need repeat the cliche now of uh, jeremy corbyn being a kind of great and articulate exponent of a tony ben like clarity i mean jeremy corbyn is more articulate on the eu and its failings if you look at the films over the years than on almost anything we've heard him say subsequently you know what i mean i mean it's sort of very peculiar that as the leader of the opposition he kind of copped out in that way but anyway that's all kind of history so when when it came to that european election i think the main thing was was that i just felt that and i mean i wasn't certainly the only one that there was just the beginnings of the bubbling up i think with the betrayal had got so bad that some of the more left leaning leavers who'd been a bit quiet if we're honest for the three and a half years like the trade unionists and and these kind of things we're just beginning to kind of bubble up again you know that we I'm a great admirer of the full brexit which are those kind of lefty left leaning academics who set up that website there were sort of left brexit meetings happening i'd been to a few of them and you know people were like that trade unionist study Dempsey and people like this were just just speaking out. And there was just mm. a bit like even some of the Novara media, Aaron Bastani, Grace Blakely, people like this were just sort of saying, actually, we do have to accept that <laughs> leaving the EU could be a positive thing for the working class. You know, there was a bit of that going on. Uh, Costas Lapovitas, mm. Lapovitas, who you've interviewed on Spike. So these kind of things were happening. When the European elections came along, I just, I suppose I really didn't want the Brexit party to be UKIP Mark II. Yeah. But the other thing was, was that, Nigel Farage didn't want the yeah. Brexit party to be UKIP Mark II. So you could say, I didn't want it to be, but I had no intentions of standing. I just wanted him to find people that, who would stand, who would show that those who voted leave 
cut across the left-right divide, but also across the class divide. I mean, you know, i.e. across ethnicity, you know, represented all sorts of people. And I, I really wanted prominent left-wing figures to emerge who would stand for the Brexit party. And it was quite difficult because it became obvious that wasn't going to happen. And, you know, they'd asked me and I'd said no. And I was also frightened of my reputation. And you've got to think that, you know, whether we like it or not, Nigel Farage has a toxic reputation. And it's not that I think he deserves it. Mm. He's sailed close to the wind and on occasions done things and said things which I deplore. But broadly speaking, he doesn't deserve the reputation he's got. But nonetheless, you know, it was kind of, oh, God, Nigel Farage, you know. But I didn't want it to be a Nigel Farage Brexit party. And like I say, he had, at least to be his credit, thought he wanted to gather... So I thought in the end, God, if I'm going to say I want somebody to stand on the left, then I yeah. better do it. However, I didn't really go in saying I'm on the left. Yeah. I mean, I did say that, I think, when I spoke, but I wasn't thinking that was going to be a dominant feature. I mean, it became a attempt at delegitimizing me standing that my liberal left peers, particularly in the media, decided to deploy against me as a way of saying that I was a lunatic and a far left extremist he wanted to go back to a party that i was in 20 years ago but had closed 20 years ago the revolutionary communist party <laughs> cite everything that had ever been published in any publication that i'd ever sold on a street when i was 20 or 21 or 22 i'm not trying to decry those things but mm. it wasn't as though i walked around saying do you know i'm a revolutionary yeah. communist party and every single interview i've done people have said well revolutionary communist party to brexit party and i've said yeah but there was a 20 20- plus year gap. It wasn't like, so, you, know, you know, people just have forgotten that for the last 20 years, many people on the left and right, if left and right have become complicated phrases, you know, free speech, is that a left or a right wing thing? You know, is it left wing to be green when you're into arguing for eco austerity? All of these things are muddled. And so I find it very annoying mm to be constantly labelled with, you know, commie Brexiteer because I was having to almost use labels which I hadn't myself used for a while, not because I felt I'd gone right wing, but because I think politics changed. But positive thing, I know that by standing, I enabled people who were Labour voters or trade unionists or people who just consider themselves to be progressive left to vote for the Brexit party in yeah. the European elections. That will mean that people like... Paul Mason and so on will say that I was a useful idiot for Farage. Yeah. But it just gave people permission to say, well, when I voted leave, I wasn't a right winger. And now I'm going to vote for the Brexit party to reassert that I wanted to leave and I haven't changed my mind. And voting for the Brexit party is not voting for Nigel Farage's UKIP Mark II because this is a different organisation, which it was and is. And therefore, in that sense, I kind of think it was worth doing. You're listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. Subscribe now so that you never miss an episode. And it would be great if you could give us a rating and maybe even a review. That is a really good way to help new listeners discover the show. In relation to the left thing, I mean, it it can become a bit of a tick where, you know, you and I come from a left-wing background. I think we probably both consider ourselves still left-wing, although everyone tells us we're far right or whatever else they want to say. But I think, you know, there is always the danger that you can become like a bit repetitive in say, in saying, I'm left, I'm left, I'm left and too defensive. Yeah, yeah. But for me, the important thing about at least remembering the fact that Euroscepticism used to be predominantly a left wing value and that you had people like Tony Benn and Barbara Castle and Peter Shaw and Michael Foote and then through to the modern times with people like the trade unions against the European Union, Paul Embry, Eddie Dempsey and others like that. I think for me, the important aspect of of at least touching upon that is just raising the question of why the left came to into existence in the first place, which yeah. was, in my view, entirely about democracy. Because the left as an idea 
whether you want to say it, it's still relevant or not, the left as an idea was that, was that it would give voice to people who didn't have a voice, not in the sense of speaking for them, but allowing them to speak for themselves and to agitate for themselves and to represent themselves through the democratic process. So that's one of the things I found so depressing about the past three and a half years, although I'm sure I'll get over it, is the way in which being left wing has shifted from meaning you give voice to ordinary people over experts and ordinary people over priests and ordinary people over those who think they know better, aristocrats and all the rest of it, towards the opposite, which is, you know, trust the experts, listen to people who've got PhDs. And and so that shift, I think, is is really worrying. I thought it was really brought home by the release of of Mike Lee's rather good film, Peter Lou, on the 200th anniversary. And then I spoke at a, a Leavers of Manchester event in St. Peter's Square where mm-hmm. the Peterloo massacre took place. And what you realize is that 200 years ago, those who would have considered themselves the very early version of the left would have the, been the people saying, you know, let the working man have a voice equal to everyone else's. And then you fast forward 200 years and you realize that those people who consider themselves left we're saying the opposite of that. So I think it's worth, in terms of the reckoning and in terms of the yeah. getting the balance right, it's worth historically establishing that the left existed for that purpose. And if it no longer plays that purpose, then it has no right whatsoever to ask, why are working class people voting for right wing parties? Why are they turning to Nigel Farage, who promises to uphold their democratic vote? Why did they turn in their millions across the red wall to Boris Johnson when he offered to recognize their political agency? So I think the left has got itself in a real bind in relation to the question of democracy in particular. Exactly, because I think the reason why it's worth remembering that left historical origin of the, the, the demand for democratic accountability and its relationship to the European Union is because precisely as you said, we've started to realise that democracy is not as deeply embedded in contemporary society as we thought. So, of course, nobody thought that you were going to have to go around saying to people, well, you do know that when the vote was brought in for the working classes that people said, were even working men, people, women, that they shouldn't have the vote because they couldn't read or write and they were therefore not educated enough. And now you're saying Mm -hmm. these people are not educated enough to vote to know what they're voting for. These arguments we thought had been dealt with and then they weren't. And it was the left, I mean, historically progressive left-wing forces that had made those arguments against that kind of elitism. So I think that's a perfectly important thing to connect to. But I also think it's worth saying that, I mean, it might have been a different story, by the way, I didn't do the great men or women of history moment, but, you know, Bob Crow would have been an important voice in this. And in a way, his untimely death as a trade union leader, leader of the RMT, left a, a gap because yeah. he was a well-respected, well-renowned, and by the way, he he had meetings with and you know was on platforms with Nigel Farage on occasion yeah. and kind of could see that there was some relationship there. And I do think that it's a shame that that union voice didn't become more to the fore. I, I really want to commend those trade unionists who did argue for this but one of the reasons why that matters is because god isn't it absolutely amazing that the left today trade unionists today think that there would be no trade union rights Mm. without the european Mm. union (laughs) and i think that that's why you want to go i'm on the left you know when you want to go because obviously a lot of people who maybe Tory Eurosceptics are not enthusiasts for trade unions or strike action or whatever. And you, I want to go, you know, without those trade unions, we wouldn't have any rights. And actually those right-wing Eurosceptics are a little bit anxious because they, they say workers' rights won't be guaranteed by the EU, but when you remind them what might guarantee them might be strikes at home, they go a bit pale, you know what I mean? Because it's a bit <laughs> like, oh, well, we don't mean that. And I really think it's important that we recognise those people who really put up a good fight. And so I want, I want in a way to reclaim the left's yeah, part of that discussion because I think it's a useful one that that completes the big picture in terms of uh, of democracy. The other thing was is that one of the things I really enjoyed doing um, over in the European Union was finding a secret pot of money where you get publications made, and we brought one out called um, "Left Wing Arguments for Sovereignty," which I really enjoyed getting <laughs> published. Which was twelve essays, actually international essays as well, from left wing Eurosceptics, and I didn't want that to be just like a badge, you know, I'm left wing. But it was as a counter to this argument that we should not take any notice of the Leave vote because it's a right-wing Trumpite 
concocted by Bannon in a secret bunker along with, you know, alt-right people wearing white hoods. I mean, every single yeah. conspiracy, you know, with Putin pulling the street. I mean, you know, you couldn't make it up. I wanted to say, actually, there's a long history here of Labour and left-wing thinking in relation to national sovereignty that is not right-wing nationalist. And there are, of course, right-wing nationalist movements growing around Europe, which I'm scared of, don't mm-hmm. get me wrong. I mean, there are nasty elements. And I wanted to be able to show that you couldn't lump everyone in with those because they wanted to leave the European Union or voted leave in 2016. So these things, I think, are not about saying you're left or right, but actually ensuring that people have a full picture of what drove that leave vote. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, in fact, one of the interesting and possibly creative tensions going ahead will be within the leave vote itself. So you have the more right-leaning aspect of the leave vote, which is pretty you know, pro-free market and people caricature it as Singapore on the Thames, which is a caricature, but not entirely a caricature. It's semi-Thatcherite. And then you have this huge working class red wall vote for Brexit, which uh, comes from communities that are passionately anti-Thatcher, very pro-public spending, uh, very pro-community and um, as sceptical of the free market as they would be of woke individualist crap identity politics. So that tension within the Brexit vote itself, I think, could be the thing that comes to the fore now that it is now that Brexit is the dominant um, force in, in British politics. I've, I've just got two more questions to ask you. The first is just something that I struggle with, and I know lots of people struggle with in the current climate, which is how you how you define yourself politically. Because I'm one of those people who I define myself politically depending on what audience I'm speaking to sometimes. But, you know, sometimes I feel quite conservative. I want to conserve educational excellence and and culture and so and everything else. Other times I feel very liberal. I'm, you know, super pro free speech, as I know you are. And I think people should be pretty much allowed to do what they want so long as they don't harm others. And sometimes I feel quite radical, particularly most importantly in relation to the question of democracy, which I think can be pushed so much further than it already exists. So uh, I find myself flitting between three categories that don't necessarily fit together. Have you worked out a neater description of your political worldview? Or, I mean, if you were to be put on the spot at a talk at a school or a university in terms of describing your political orientation, what's, how do you respond to that question? God, it's almost <laughs> impossible, but I do. I use the formulation at the moment, radical Democrat, yeah. and I, but it's not satisfactory, but it, it does sum up the way I feel, but it's not satisfactory. I think that one of the things that is tricky, and I actually blame, I, I think that one of the things we all want to get away from, because I blame the kind of way that people say that's far right or that's a label or this equals, you know, if you worry about immigration, that must mean this. And if you worry about that, it, it just doesn't help because I think that, so, for example, I am very still very liberal about my attitude to immigration. I think I'd be very liberal, but I know I have to win the arguments yeah. with my fellow citizens. But I'm much less anxious about what it would mean to have, you know, unskilled workers coming into the country than a lot of people are. I don't think that immigrants coming from countries where they've got no skills means that you have to have rubbish further education colleges that don't teach anyone anything. You know, I mean, you can improve skills at home, but I don't think you should have freedom of movement. So, you know, what does all that amount to? I at least want the conversation. Mm. I've had quite a lot of run-ins recently about the issue of citizenship. Mm. And, you know, a lot of that argument centres on, I understand a kind of irritation and disdain for people saying Shamima Begum, for example, as a, a, you know, somebody who willfully and willingly joined ISIS, should be kind of welcomed back into the heart of UK justice system. I understand people being irritated by that approach and they say, well, we want to dump her. But it's like, well, yes, but she's a British citizen and I don't want the state to be able to strip people of British citizenship, even though she disavowed it, mm. that you, you're dumping her somewhere else, right? Who Whose is she then? We also have to own her. Even though I might own her, bring her back, I'm not saying give her a kind of fesh, I might throw away the key. That's not really my <laughs> point. I might introduce a treason law in order to deal with the likes of her. So I'm not tra- talking about being soft, but as soon as you say that, then actually people who are, as it were, anti-liberal, anti-woke, immediately like, oh, you're supporting, you're making apologies for ISIS members. Or, you know, in other words, 
we're all too quick to put people into boxes and label them. And I include people who I might have agreed with on some things like Brexit or, you know, whatever. So what I really want to happen is, is that we just have more debate and discussion, which mm. sounds so pathetic as the director of the Academy of Ideas <laughs> who organises more debates and discussions. But I can't see another way around it. These are complicated questions. They're, sometimes I just don't know the answer. I don't know what I think about you know, criminals who are being deported to Jamaica when some of them thought they were British citizens but hadn't filled in the paperwork. You know, I want to be humane, not because I'm like, well, I am a softie, but it's not even because of that. It's because I actually believe that being humane and thinking about people as human beings is an important way for society to develop. But I also want to be an internationalist and I want to encourage people to go to university and I want to encourage people to move away from their local neighbourhoods so that they can broaden their minds. But I also think it's utterly galling that people imagine that people who live in the same place and are affectionate about it and don't want it to change too much are somehow Philistine, you know, backward people. So these are complicated matters. And by the way, there is an, a critique I would make of, you know, myself say is it is tricky because we say things like metropolitan elite. Mm. We know it's shorthand. We know what we mean, but we've also got to be careful that we don't caricature people who are actually aspirational and want to get away from the kind of cloying small townness that they left behind. You know, we've all, well, certainly I did that. It doesn't mean I've suddenly become a kind of anywhere that doesn't care <laughs> about my local town, you know? So, how do we do that other than to start stripping away labels and saying it's not helpful? I mean, I can't think of another way of saying it. Just say, take the issue as it is, let's pull it apart from every single possible angle and think about it. And then we might get somewhere. Yeah. That's my way of thinking about it. So that doesn't answer your question no, because I, th I think it's impossible at the moment to do. I, I don't think that's soft at all. And in fact, that's, I would say that that is the whole idea behind Brexit. The great thing, in my view, about the vote for Brexit, which distinguishes it from the vote for Trump, uh, the vote for various populist parties in Europe, some of which I think are positive developments in, in a roundabout way, but they're complicated by the fact that people are voting for something problematic. The good thing about the vote for Brexit is that it's a vote for the throwing open of political life to more democratic accountability and democratic input. So it's, it's open-ended. So this is what irritates me about people who say, oh, you're voting for a xenophobic nation with less immigration and more free market politics. I mean, there's no outcome to Brexit at all. And in fact, it's the opposite. It's the potential creation for this, uh, of the space for more and more debate about the key questions. It's the, yeah. the re-democratization of public life. I, I just wanted to quickly say that I always say that, you know, when George Osborne tried to say, you know, if you take this situation, if you, if you vote leave, you're, you're leaping off a cliff. And I used to think, well, that's exciting, isn't that? Yeah. We learn to fly. I mean, you might be, you <laughs> might, I mean, that's the way that everything from entrepreneurialism to every single progressive breakthrough was to leap into the unknown. You know, it was absolutely unknown what would happen if you gave working people a vote yeah. or women. I mean, these things are completely disruptive, right? right? Abolish slavery. Wow. This is a big thing. And so, and every, you know, fly aeroplanes in the sky. I mean, <laughs> railways. I mean, these were leaps into the unknown. They would have the most disruptive consequences. And he tried to say, don't do it. It's a leap into the unknown. So I like that yeah. leap into the unknown, yeah. but it's a bit scary because you don't know what's going to happen and you might fall. And, yeah. you know, that change is like that. It's not a guarantee. Yeah. It's actually a risk, but with all the potential at risk, exciting possibilities of it. But, the, but I suppose the other thing is just that, like you say, what, why is it a closed debate all the time? I don't think we know the answers, but we're asking the questions. And maybe that's what, you know, the, the reaction against the technocrats and the, the, the period of there is no alternative where you just felt sidelined from major discussions and ideology didn't count meant that people just were, you know, demobilized and demoralized by being done to, as has been mentioned many times. But one of the funny side effects of them delaying delivering Brexit is if they'd have delivered leaving the EU in 2016, it would have been the most mild populist revolt mm. in the history of populism because it just would not have made that much difference, mm. if I'm honest. I mean, it would have been significant, but 
by putting it off and trying to stop it, they radicalise mm, people. Absolutely. I mean, not the whole 17.4 million, fair enough, but, you know, people just realised what they were up against. And I think that that then has given people a taste for, you know, the possibilities of what change needs to be, how it has to be a bit more in depth than simply just having a new government or whatever. That's why, I mean, I, I can do my advert now. I mean, the last thing that, that I'm going to do formally as an MEP, but as a former MEP, along, as I say, with Henrik uh, Ogard nielsen is we've got a conference called What Next? Changing Politics for Good. Because the one slogan that resonated from the Brexit party was change politics for good. People loved that slogan. So they'd say Brexit can't just be Brexit, you know. Yeah. And people were saying this to me. I mean, anyway, so I just want you to know, we're going to vote for you, but Brexit can't just be Brexit, you know. Now, by the time we got to the general election, it was a bit like get Brexit done. I know that. But there was a sense in which that change politics for good was really mattered. And I noticed during the general election that a lot of people were coming up to me and saying about candidates standing for the Brexit party, look, you've got to bear in mind, my heart's with the Brexit party. You're the ones who want to change politics for good, and so do I. But I'm voting Tory because I want to, kick the Labour Party. I want to stop the Labour Party and the Lib Dems stopping us Brexiting, right? So they were mm. quite clear. But there was a real attachment, not to the Brexit, because what does that mean, but to that change politics for good. Now, I'm not trying to overstate it, but anyway, we've organised a conference on the 29th of February, a Saturday conference in Stockport in Edgeley in the football club, uh, which everyone should come to and which will be advertised, I'm sure, on Spikes. But we wanted to do it to show this is a real town hall meeting, you know. It's a full day conference discussing everything from the plight of coastal towns to how we do, whether we should have PR and all this sort of, um, every discussion you could think of, the future of the union under Brexit. But just trying to say, look, why don't people organise these things? And when I said earlier that I think citizens' assemblies are a disastrous idea, I'm hoping that this will prove that you can assemble citizens and it be a <laughs> bit more creative and open-ended I just want people to do those things all over the place. Yeah. You know, at the Academy of Ideas, we do a big festival, the Battle of Ideas. You've mentioned that's great and I want that, but I want people to self-organise, a bit of DIY, uh, pop-up debates all over the country, experimenting with ways of having discussions, standing in council elections if they want, or getting involved in, you know, stopping the local swimming pool being closed, but also holding people to account, taking that agency and making it matter. So... That's my modest contribution to it. But I think and hope that there'll be a lot more of that going on. My last question actually was on Changing Politics for Good. What next? Your conference in Stockport on the 29th of February. I guess just as an additional final, final, final question to what you've just said, pushing the conference. How much legs do you think Democratic Promise has at the moment? How far do you think it can be pushed? I find myself flitting between thinking we're going through an incredibly radical moment in which vast numbers of ordinary people have forced the political establishment um, and reprimanded the political establishment and put pressure on it to um, adhere to the promise of democracy. I think that's pretty much what the past three and a half years has been about in a roundabout way. How much further do you think it can be pushed? Because I've also encountered so many people who've said, you know, Brexit's great, get Brexit done, and then what? And I think the the, the possibility of something more whether it's more referendums, reforming the House of Lords, all of that is there. But what do you think it depends on in terms of pushing that further and further? The bit where well, it's a completely unknown question, but I do think that what has happened is that I, I don't know that you can push it too much. And I keep saying to my you know colleagues or my erstwhile colleagues around the Brexit party, people are saying the Brexit party are going to stand. Nigel Farage kind of mentioned he's going to set up the reform party, but it's not going to happen in truth, you know, people are saying, should we have, should we, can we start a new party? And I'm saying, well, I'm not, um, you know, I, I, it's not, I, these things have got to be more organic, I think. And what I think though is, is that you can't quite tell what things will turn on. So in the Northwest, just to use the example, I mean, the, one of the issues, which is, you know, you've written about, but still neglected is the grooming gangs. Mm. And of course, it's nerve wracking, by the way, because obviously you, you enter into a territory there of the difficulties around race and ethnicity and the demonization of people because of their ethnicity. But on the other hand, the huge 
institutional cover up and neglect of the mass abuse of young women in the Northwest region. They're still going on. I mean, a report came out from Manchester, you know, very comprehensive and damning report, but it just didn't get the headlines. You know, you just feel like this should be a scandal, shouldn't it? So it is a scandal, but not that big a scandal. So that kind of issue can just bubble up. At the same time, I think, I have found that people have really incensed around some of the issues around eco austerity. So you, you, you again, and we've seen that internationally a little bit in, um, obviously in France, the Gilets Jaunes started in that place. This is an incomprehension mm. in some areas that people would start saying, you, you're going to ban petrol cars. And you know, he's like, what are you talking about? Put heating bills up. You know, these things matter to people, not just in a material sense, but it just again feels like this imposition. So the reason I'm using those examples, and they are populist examples in a way, is that I feel as though people feel it's not done yet, mm. but none of us know exactly what might trigger a kind of, new round. Now, by the way, this is nerve wracking because I would rather it wasn't just some spontaneous throw to the wind, see what happens moment, because then, you know, there are reactionary movements that can spring up in relation to some issues. And, but, I, but certainly there's a lot of unanswered questions. So when I've just said to you that a lot of people voted for the conservatives as a vehicle, but they are not Tories right now. They're not sectarian in the sense that they're going to go I'm not going to give them an inch. They're waiting to see. But you also know the Conservatives are more than capable of messing this up and getting it wrong and being tin-eared and tone-deaf and God knows what they'll come up with. And I don't just mean about Brexit. I mean, in general, they think, oh, well, if we do a bit of infrastructure stuff in the North, everyone will be happy. And it's like, no, you're missing the point. Mm. But I do also think that the Tories could capture some of it. And if they do, well, I'm not going to complain as long as it becomes a democratic way of people being taken seriously and equally as citizens. Don't want to be sectarian about that. But I think it's unlikely to last for more than a year or so, and then they'll kind of forget. So I imagine that new movements might emerge. But also you can't, historically you can't force things. A big win has happened. People now know that the establishment can't get away with pulling the wool over their eyes or treating them like second-class citizens. But that doesn't mean they're about to have a revolution any minute. Of course it doesn't mean that. But it does mean that they're alert and awake to the possibility that they are going to be done to in the future. And that gives them the opportunity to seize another moment. Whatever that moment will be, you can write about what you think it should be. I can go on the tally and talk about what I think it should be. We can organise conferences discussing the kind of things we think are important to mobilise around. But ultimately, that becomes a bit of a historic question, not our question. Mm. Also, despite everyone thinking this is a little England movement, which obviously it never was, or xenophobic or anything, internationally, things are just fascinating. Mm. So that that instability thrown up by what's happening internationally, I don't mean in your, just in European countries, but I think people are now looking, you know, people do know about the Gilets Jaunes. They are looking at what's happening in Hong Kong, but they're also very conscious of, you know, debates that are happening in Australia, debates that are happening in the US. People, it seems to me, are politicised. And that means that what happens elsewhere will also affect the way they consider British politics from now on in. And ironically, much more internationally conscious and following international events than they ever were when we were stuck in the EU, which apparently was the great (laughs) cosmopolitan international moment where nobody knew what was happening in any of the European countries that we were in bed (laughs) with. But now people are, aren't they? And they follow it closely. So I think anything could happen. That's what makes it exciting. And if nothing happens, enough's happened for one lifetime for me Um, (laughs) I'm glad what's happened has happened I want more but in the end if you're going to trust people to take history into their own hands you've also got to just go well you know over to you Claire Fox thank you very much Thank you for listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. We'll be back with another guest and more discussion. Don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, keep reading Spiked at www.spiked-online.com.